Chapter Two of Ox Team Days on the Oregon Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Easton. Ox Team Days on the Oregon Trail by Ezra Meeker and Howard Driggs. Chapter Two Boyhood Days in Old Indiana. When we reached Indiana, we settled down on a rented farm. Times were hard with us, and for a season all the members of the household were called upon to contribute their might. I drove four yoke of oxen for twenty-five cents a day, and during part of the time boarded at home at that. This was on the Wabash, where oak grubs grew, my father often said, as thick as hair on a dog's back, but they were really not so thick as that. We used to force the big plowshare through and cut grubs as big as my wrist. When we saw a patch of them ahead, I would halloo and shout at the poor oxen and lay on the whip, but father wouldn't let me swear at them. Let me say here that I later discontinued this foolish fashion of driving and always talked to my oxen in a conversational tone and used the whip sparingly. That reminds me of an experience I had later, in the summer when I was nineteen. Uncle John Kenworthy, a good soul he was, and an ardent Quaker, lived neighbor to us in Bridgeport, Indiana. One day I went to his house with three yoke of oxen to haul into place a heavy beam for a cider press. The oxen had to be driven through the front dooryard in full sight and hearing of Uncle John's wife and three buxom Quaker girls who either stood in the door or poked their heads out of the window. The cattle would not go through the front yard past those girls. They kept doubling back, first on one side and then on the other. Uncle Johnny, noticing that I did not swear at the cattle, and attributing the absence of oaths to the presence of ladies, or maybe thinking, like a good many others, that oxen could not be driven without swearing at them, sought an opportunity when the mistress of the house could not hear him, to say in a low tone, If thee can do any better, thee had better let out the word. My father, though a miller by trade, early taught me some valuable lessons about farming that I never forgot. We, I say we advisedly, as father continued to work in the mill and left me in charge of the farm, soon brought the run-down farm to the point where it produced twenty-three bushels of wheat to the acre instead of ten, by the rotation of corn and clover and then wheat. But there was no money in farming at the prices then prevailing and the land for which father paid ten dollars an acre would not yield a rental equal to the interest on the money the same land has recently sold for six hundred dollars an acre for a time i worked in the journal printing office for s v b no who published a free soil paper a part of my duty was to deliver the papers to subscribers they treated me civilly but when i was caught in the streets of indianapolis with the free soil papers in my hand i was sure of abuse from someone and a number of times narrowly escaped personal violence from the pro-slavery people in the office i was known as the devil a term that annoyed me not a little i worked with wood the pressman as a roller boy and in the same room was a power press the power being a stalwart negro who turned a crank Wood and I used to race with the power press, and then I would fly the sheets, that is, take them off when printed, with one hand and roll the type with the other. This so pleased Noel that he advanced my wages to a dollar and a half a week. One of the subscribers to whom I delivered that anti-slavery paper was Henry Ward Beecher, then pastor of the Congregational Church that faced the Governor's Circle. At that time he had not attained the fame that came to him later in life. I became attached to him because of his kind manner and the gentle words he always found time to give me. One episode of my life at this time I remember because I thought my parents were in the wrong. Vocal music was taught in singing school, which was conducted almost as regularly as were the day schools. I was passionately fond of music. Before the change of my voice came, I had a fine alto voice and was a leader in my part of the class. This fact coming to the notice of the trustees of Beecher's Church, an effort was made to have me join the choir. Mother first objected, because my clothes were not good enough. Then an offer was made to clothe me suitably and pay me something besides. And now father objected, 
because he did not want me to listen to preaching of a sect other than that to which he belonged. The incident set me to thinking, and finally drove me, young as I was, into a more liberal faith, though I dared not openly espouse it. Another incident that occurred while I was working in the printing office I have remembered vividly all these years. During the campaign of 1844, the Whigs held a gathering on the Tippecanoe battleground. It could hardly be called a convention. A better name for it would be a political camp meeting. The people came in wagons, on horseback, afoot, any way to get there, and camped, just as people used to do at religious camp meetings. The journeymen printers of the journal office planned to go in a covered wagon, and they offered to make a place for the devil if his parents would let him go along. This was speedily arranged with Mother, who always took charge of such matters. When the proposition came to Noel's ears, he asked the men to print me some campaign songs. This they did with a will, Wood running them off the press after the day's work while I rolled the type for him. My, wasn't I the proudest boy that ever walked the earth. Visions of a pocket full of money haunted me almost day and night until we arrived on the battlefield. But lo and behold, nobody would pay any attention to me. Bands were playing here and there. Glee clubs would sing and march, first on one side of the ground and then on the other. Processions were parading and crowds surging, making it necessary to look out lest one be run over. Although the rain would pour down in torrents, the marching and counter-marching went on all the same and continued for a week. An elderly journeyman printer named May, who in a way stood sponsor for our party, told me that if I would get up on the fence and sing the songs, the people would buy them. Sure enough, when I stood up and sang, the crowds came, and I sold every copy I had. I went home with eleven dollars in my pocket, the richest boy on earth. In the year 1845, a letter came from Grandfather Baker in Ohio to my mother, saying that he would give her a thousand dollars with which to buy a farm. The burning question with my father and mother was how to get the money out from Ohio to Indiana. They actually went in a covered wagon to Ohio for it and hauled it home, all silver, in a box. This silver was nearly all foreign coin. Prior to that time, but a few million dollars had been coined by the United States government. Grandfather Baker had accumulated his money by marketing small things in Cincinnati, twenty-five miles distant. I have heard my mother tell of going to market on horseback with Grandfather many times, carrying eggs, butter, and even live chickens on the horse she rode. Grandfather would not go into debt, so he lived on his farm a long time without a wagon. He finally became so wealthy that he was reputed to have a barrel of money, silver, of course. Out of this store came the thousand dollars that he gave Mother. It took nearly a whole day to count the money. At least one of nearly every coin from every nation on earth seemed to be there, and the tables had to be consulted in computing the value. I was working on the journal at the time when the farm was bought, but it seemed that I was not cut out for a printer. My inclinations ran more to open-air life, so Father placed me on the farm as soon as the purchase was made and left me in full charge of the work there, while he gave his time to milling. Be it said that I early turned my attention to the girls as well as to the farm and married young, before I reached the age of twenty-one. This truly was a fortunate venture, for my wife and I lived happily together for fifty-eight years. End of chapter 2